Coming up on this week's show, the definitive operating system for retro gaming. The Sega Saturn Switch emulator gets hacked. And we talk kickoff with the legend Dino Dini. The Retro Hour podcast is brought to you each week with our good friends at Bitmap Books. Now, available from the end of this month, check out The Secret History of Mac Gaming Expanded Edition. If you thought the Mac wasn't a gaming platform, it started some of the biggest franchises in gaming history, Myst, Halo, SimCity, to name but a few, and this book goes really in-depth, over 480 pages long. Available from the end of this month, check that out on the rest of their retro gaming books at bitmapbooks.co.uk. Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 298, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. Me, Ravi Abbott. And me, Joe Fox. And a very warm welcome to this week's show, the podcast that talks about classic video games. Video games like, uh, I don't know, Mortal Kombat, Pac-Man, Space Invade. Name some retro games, Joe. Oh, why, why do you always put me on the, uh, <laughs> on, the <laughs> on the spot? Come on, this is meant to be a pacey Jesus. intro. Like Time Crisis, Contra, Resident Evil, Castlevania, anything like that. If you like anything retro, you're going to find it here on the Retro Hour. There you go. (laughs) That is what we do each week. Not only do we bring you up to date on everything that's happening in the world of retro gaming and technology, which, you know, over the uh, almost 300 episodes of this podcast now, um, that we'll talk more about in just a moment. But we've, uh, we've seen the retro scene over the six years. It just seems to get bigger and bigger all the time, doesn't it? Because I remember in our early episodes... There were a lot of people that thought we might maybe get to maybe 10, 20 episodes and we'd probably run out of steam or things to talk about by then, but it didn't happen. In fact, it's busier than ever now. It's it's crazy, yeah. Uh, we have people like, oh, you're going to run out of guests and everything, and it's like we're nearly hitting 300. And, you know, I thought we were going to run out of news as well, but uh, there's mm. a new news item every single week and quite a few, you know, there's a lot going on. It's like a, it's a bit of an industry, isn't it, this kind of retro tech and nostalgia industry uh you know old computing add-ons kind of uh little mini systems and all of these devices that are coming out and you know when we started a lot of it was like homebrew and kind of mm. homemade stuff and people just creating cool little products but now it's actually companies on it and uh commercial which is kind of crazy yeah it definitely has developed into almost a, a sub-genre of gaming i think retro gaming yeah definitely and, and and you know what also helps like you know people thought like oh they're gonna run out of guests and stuff like that it helps that like, we've been going that long now stuff's becoming retro what wasn't retro when we started <laughs> yeah. so we can start interviewing them lot the first episode is retro <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> you're right though yeah cause, i mean we, you know we're covering stuff like you know moving into playstation 2 and gamecube and that era which you know when we started this six years ago a lot of people said, yeah, maybe the Dreamcast didn't get away with that being retro, but PlayStation 2 isn't yet. Now I think, you know, PS2 being over 20 years old now is definitely in that camp of retro, even though there are some people that would disagree with that. But I think from our perspective, it definitely is. But it does mean we've just got so many different games and so many different genres to cover. And I think actually, um, over the almost six years that we've done this, probably we haven't covered football games quite as much as we should have, because it's a massive genre. We haven't covered sports games as much as we should have, really. And uh, yeah, I think particularly football games. And uh, today we are talking to an absolute legend, and that's Dino Dini. And he's behind the kickoff series of games. And, you know, that's a really fast football game. If you've ever played kickoff, it's like it runs at a really high frame rate. And there was a whole series of them, absolutely fantastic games. I'm an Amiga fan, and uh, I loved kickoff. You know, there's a lot of people raised on the kickoff series and Dino, you know, he, he was the main man behind it and it was for Anko software as well, which was a, yeah. a small kind of Dartford based um, little software house. And, and, and we've had Steve Screech actually on the podcast previously. And it's, it's good to get Dino on because we heard a lot about the kind of stories and the stuff that were going on. And uh, you know, this game, this game really made Anko software, didn't it? Yeah. Well, I remember, cause, I mean, I'm, you know, hands up, I'm not, really a football fan at all. Um, you know, watch it when the World Cup's on down the pub or whatever. But actually, in terms of football games, I play something like FIFA. 
and I'm completely lost. I've got no idea what I'm doing. But games like Kickoff, you know, because it was such a, it was more like an arcade game, really. You didn't have to really know the rules of football. And, you know, it was a very fast action based game and you could play it. You know, it was a great couch gaming experience. And I found the same, you know, we've done an episode with John Hare about sensible soccer in the early days of this show. Those are kind of the two games that were not only similar in the regard of they were both arcade kind of games and very fast, but also they're actually pitted against each other as rivals back in the day, mainly by the magazines probably. Yeah, and also like um, he worked on the player manager series and stuff. So there was a lot of kind of using the same engine and uh, a lot of different versions of the game and stuff. But yeah, there was this this great war that was uh, that was kind of hyped up in the press and stuff. And, and, and we definitely talk about that. This is a very open interview from Dino and uh you know it's 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 really great of him to come on and chat to us I will say that you're right because um I remember I went to a video games museum in Rome um probably about five years ago I think we just started doing the show then um called Vigamous and actually spotted a BBC micro that was actually Dino Dini's old BBC micro that he donated to the museum and he'd signed it and everything and I remember thinking at the time He'd be a great guest on the podcast. It's actually taken us about, you know, five years to um, actually get Dino on. Um, but actually, it was worth the wait because at the time we asked him, it was when a kickoff revival came out. And as you'll hear in the interview, that was a quite a difficult time for him. And the the journey from those original kickoff games through the last like 25 years or so, it hasn't been all smooth sailing. And actually, Dino, this is I'd say this is one of the most open and honest interviews that we've ever had from a guest. I was, I was about to say that this is one of the most frank kind of mm. open interviews and, uh, you know, it, real pleasure that he's actually come on and, and talked to us. And, um, you know, what we like to do on this show is kind of get people's full story, warts and all. And, uh, yeah. this is definitely that. So, uh, I hope you're all going to enjoy this episode. And we've all said that we never take slides. We'll let people just come on and give their version of the story and let us know their history. So that's what this show is all about. It's capturing those stories, you know, and hopefully people can listen to this podcast in a hundred years after we're long gone and kind of hear what was happening at this time in gaming. That's kind of the aim that it's um, all preserved there. So it's going to be a really interesting episode. Dino Dinny, the kickoff legend, he's coming up in around 25 minutes from now. Now, it hasn't actually been a great week for um, everyone in the retro gaming community. Of course, we did hear some very sad news. Um, there's someone who I know, he hangs out in our Discord, and, um, and I know he's listened to the show before. Um, and actually, I think we maybe spoke to him by getting him on at some point. Uh, this is Mark Fixes Stuff, who you probably know from um, Neil, RMC's channel. He regularly appears on there. He had a bit of a tragedy over the weekend, didn't he? Yeah, so Mark's on um, Neil's channel when actually Mark was kind of Neil's bubble during lockdown RMC. Yeah. So, you know, he had him in the museum and stuff. And Mark, as he, as his channel says, fixes stuff. But um, I, I saw an amazingly um, emotional video and, you know, just watching it, you kind of see how gut-wrenching it is. His, his house has actually been completely gutted by fire. And the poor guy, um, you know... He had a flood before, so his house, he he was getting it repaired and fixed up. Uh, Luckily, nobody was in the actual house, but um, Mm. yeah, it's been totally gutted. And poor Mark, man, you know, um, it's just tragic when something like that happens with all your memories and uh, just your whole life pretty much going. So there's been a fundraiser that's been uh, running for Mark, and amazingly, they've uh, hit 20K already. Yeah, I'll stick it out on Friday. Then if it updates, I'll, um, I'll put it out on Twitter as well if people want to check it out. But um, I mean, you know, you watch his latest video and it shows, you can just see like the shell of a PlayStation and uh, his MSX is just melted on the floor. And as guys who have a collection of retro systems and a collection of retro games, you know, it, it's your worst nightmare, not only losing everything in your house, your whole collection going in one fell swoop as well. It's, it's always just, a worry, isn't it? Because yeah. some of these machines that we're using are like 30, 40 years old and stuff. And uh, yeah, you know, it's it's uh, be safe, folks, you know, be safe out there and, and, and sensible with what you're doing. That is one thing I've seen come out of this, the amount of people now that are suddenly like, well, maybe I'm going to check those power supplies and maybe I'm going to make sure there's a smoke alarm working. And, you know, so in a way... It could help other people, you know, the fact that it's obviously a massive tragedy that he's gone through this, but a good, you know, reminder to, to check things over and make sure everything's electrically safe. Uh, but of course, if you're doing a donate to Mark, I mean, it's the whole community is coming together to help him get back on his feet again. So we'll link that up in our show notes, the latest fundraiser, and uh, hope you can rebuild Mark. Best of luck. 
Now, before we get into the news stories this week, let's give a huge thank you to one of our lovely friends who support the Retro Hour podcast. And this is our good mates at monsterjoysticks.com. Have you got your monster joystick nearby, Ravi? Uh, Yeah, I have. And I've got it attached to my Amiga at the moment because it does one vital function, which is it remaps up to jump to another button so it actually uh, makes my amiga exper- experience really good i'd say it's probably the best controller i've had for the amiga and uh you know there's been lots out there but uh this one is my arcade one of choice and i'm running it on my cd32 at the moment absolutely awesome kit and it's got those uh, genuine samwar arcade parts as well you know when you were a kid wasn't it always a dream to have a proper arcade joystick at home a clicky oh, joystick That's a what cli- i was gonna say a clicky joystick not just a joystick, a clicky one, Dan. <laughs> yeah, I had like a zip stick and a competition pro, but a proper arcade stick, like the yeah. one, yeah, micro switch and everything. I always wanted one like that at home. And now finally, you know, if that was your childhood dream as well, you can get one now. Like you said, it's genuine arcade parts in here. They offer a wide range of quality arcade joysticks. And actually they do it in a couple of variants as well. They do retro gaming joystick kits that work with your classic machines like the Amiga, the Atari ST, the C64, the Spectrum. They do versions as well for consoles like the CD32, PC Engine, the Mega Drive, and they also do these incredible, which I've got one of these in my living room, hooked up to my TV, um, an all-in-one nine-button Raspberry Pi arcade stick. Now, this is where the Raspberry Pi can actually live inside the joystick, and it gives you, essentially, a truly portable quality arcade machine. You know, you just take the power supply around, HDMI cable, plug it in to any TV, and you're playing your arcade games. You put MAME on the Raspberry Pi. And they've got deluxe kits as well with the genuine Sanwar arcade parts, Designed to survive the most extreme usage, which if you've ever seen me play games like Mortal Kombat, which I know uh, Joe's definitely witnessed, it needs to be rugged to survive my, uh, <laughs> my rage. They need to be rugged to survive the rage quits, but they definitely do. <laughs> they definitely do yeah. survive. I, I think that's Joe's uh, Christmas present in the back there. I, uh, I was going to say, I, I, was just, I was just looking at this going, I hope I get one of these. <laughs> well, I mean, they're, they're really precise as well, you know, especially if you want to play those classic arcade games and that muscle memory is all still mapped there. I mean, you're not going to get any lag or anything like that and even do some more um, budget friendly arcade part options as well and you can assemble the kits yourself you only need a screwdriver you don't have to solder or anything like that really straightforward even i can put these together so you can check them out and support the podcast their link is monsterjoysticks.com and a big thank you to our mates at monster joysticks for their support of our show Now, the time this podcast comes out, actually, a lot of people are getting hyped for um, the N64 and Mega Drive games that come to the Nintendo Switch. I believe it's um, October 25th, like next Monday. But actually, there are other emulators that already kind of run secretly in the background on the Switch, including a Sega Saturn emulator that's been used for a few retro games on there that's now actually been exploited and turned into pretty much a full Saturn emulator that you can run a load of games on the Switch. This really confused me when, because of you guys did the news this week. I didn't do the news this week. That's why there's no Castlevania or Resident Evil. And uh, <laughs> and I was like, wait, what? What have I missed? The Sega Saturns on the Switch? Like, when when did this happen? Like, you know, I saw the announcements last, you know, the other week for the Mega Drive and the N64. But no, no, it's not not quite what I thought. So, like like you say, Dan, um, there was a bundle released earlier this year um, of Cotton Two, Cotton Boomerang and Guardian Force, which are all Sega Saturn shoot-em-ups, um, which is both tweet, uh, both ported to PS4 and the Switch. And apparently they weren't the best ports. They've got quite a bit of lag to mm. them. So some fans, as they always do, have hacked, <laughs> hacked the game <laughs> and found that they are running on a Sega Saturn uh, emulator. Um, and the technology, the emulation technology is called Zebra Engine. And essentially they found that you can just plonk any old Sega Saturn game in their ROM and it works really, really, really well, apparently. But apparently it's a variant of a of a engine called SSF that's actually an open source or sorry, a closed source emulator that's been around for about twenty years. Um so I've heard but apparently it works really, really well to put other games in there. Now I'm just hoping that like, you know, Nintendo don't do any sort of patch to like brick your switch when you do this. But that sounds awesome to me. You know, there's a really, really cool hour long uh, video about it that will be, you know, in the show notes, which I haven't got around to watching yet. Cause like I say, I, w- I was completely baffled by this, but this looks absolutely awesome. Now Ravi's now, correct me if I'm wrong on this Ravi or have I, have I nailed it there? 
Yeah, you've you've pretty much nailed it. Um, awesome, because <laughs> it's, it's 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 a tough one to emulate the, yeah. the Saturn because it's it's got those two CPUs. And, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, the, the the one thing I'd say is yeah, they found it inside this. It's a game GBA Temp forums, which if you haven't checked out GBA Temp, wicked. That's where I get all my Wii U modding stuff from because they're always modding absolutely mm. everything on on that site. So it's really really good resource and cool community and they found out if you've got a homebrew um switch then you can actually swap out the game that is within this uh emulator uh so it has to be a hack switch then you've got a yeah yeah, switch, yeah yeah so so you'd swap out cotton 2 or one of them with one of the games now the thing is this is like really accurate with all of the games like uh, you said there's a lag on there that's an input lag Mm. But if you overclock the switch, um, the input lag's like greatly reduced. So if you use like, you know, you've got a homebrew setup on there, you've got a little overclocker app. So if you actually overclock it, then then it has the power to deal with it. Because, you know, I guess it takes a lot of power to um, accurately kind of do the uh, Saturn one. And it's pretty mad that they released it with that bit of input lag, to be honest, isn't it? Yeah, it looks like it can just about emulate the Saturn by the sounds of it, you know, without overclocking the machine. They're saying here they've tried a bunch of games in it as well, and actually some of them run really well. Uh, they've got Knights into Dreams running on there. Panzer Dragoon is running really good. Uh, Burning Rangers as well, Clockwork Knight. Um, they run perfectly, but it said there are some games that actually do still suffer from that input lag. Okay. So I imagine it's ones that are probably a bit more demanding. Yeah, yeah it's, know, it's, it's not well, quite spec. It's it's if you overclock it. So I watched a great video on MVG, and he was showing the kind of process of um, how to do it and how to get it working. And he said actually, like ninety percent of them are working well without graphical glitches and stuff. And I don't know how many frames it is. I think it was a four frame input lag, but you can reduce it down to like a frame or a couple of frames, uh, which is well impressive. And you know, this may lead to um, a kind of Saturn emulator coming out commercially then. Um, but I don't know, you know, they'll probably do it. So it would all be individual releases, wouldn't they? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, yeah. Well, we, we've talked about that. It's like the fact that th- there are some great games that, you know, obviously stuff has come out on a lot of the stores and stuff over the years. But there's still, I mean, for example, these, you know, shmup games, a lot of them aren't available on other platforms. And it kind of feels like there is definitely a untapped kind of resource there in the Saturn library, a lot of games that are kind of locked I, into that system. There, I think there's definitely a market for it as well because of, you know, th- there is more expensive consoles out there, but the Saturn is really expensive to collect for. Like some of these games are like ridiculously hard to get hold of, ridiculously expensive. And there isn't any, you know, from my knowledge, like um, Panzer Dragoon Saga is like a £700, $1,000 game. And I don't think there's any remasters or ports of that game. So I can see why there is that market for people wanting to emulate Sega Saturns on the Switch and stuff. So they, they are definitely missing it, missing a trick, you know, with some of these games. But I'm just wondering from, you know, Ravi telling us then, maybe it's because the quality isn't quite just there yet, you know, with like the dual C, you know, the dual CPUs and stuff like that, you know. Maybe Sega do want to do a Saturn Mini and stuff, but they're struggling, who knows? Yeah. And it's, and it's weird that they kind of do this release as well, just shoving the four games on an emulator and doing it. Maybe they were trying mm. to do it quicker or something. But, uh, yeah, it it does seem like a little little kind of leak, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> or, or, yeah, or, or they, they've made it kind of easy. It's interesting. I, I, I'd love to see what they're going to do with this, uh, some of the Switch tinkerers. Yeah, it, it does kind of feel like Sega kind of ignore the Saturn in the grand scheme of things, whether it's something they just rather forget about because it was a bit of a flop. Um, but like you said, Joe, it might just be the fact that they, they haven't got it running as smoothly as they want just yet. Maybe that will come. Yeah, so maybe, yeah. It would be nice to see more of that. Um, I must admit, I don't hack my Switch. Nah. I've watched videos <laughs> on it and it looks like tempting, but yeah, I, I haven't got the balls to do it, if I'm honest. Nah, I give same. it to Ravi. I, would, yeah, I, I wouldn't want to touch it. <laughs> it took me that long to get clip. one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it looks dead easy as well. So uh, yeah, we'll keep an eye on that. Very cool indeed. Now, we've been talking about these um, mini arcades. You know, there seems to be a new one every week at the moment. Uh, this is one, actually, I used to play in my local video shop when mm-hmm. I was a kid who randomly got um, a Capcom 1942 cabinet in, I remember, for a summer. 
Um, probably about 1990, 91, they got one in, and they go in there and play it on a Saturday. Um, a game I was never very good at, but um, again, when I mean, you're talking about shoot 'em up games, I've always quite liked shoot 'em ups, and that was one of the biggest back in the day. And uh, now it's got a home release, a mini arcade cabinet that looks actually really nice. Um, this is a replicade of 1942. Yeah, this this. Took me straight back. This did. I. I'm. I've not played the 1942 games and 1943 and stuff like that very much. But I remember playing them on an arcade in Viorcia Ventura when I was like 10 years old. Mm. With all the, you know, the wood paneling, and they've captured the wood paneling really well on this. Like, it looks amazing. So I read the review of it, and I had to kind of go hunting a little bit to kind of, you know, find out what the crack is. So it's only a 10 inch arcade machine, isn't it? It's only mm. a, a little tabletop one. And, you know, I'm getting mixed kind of feelings from it. Like, it's $150, which feels a little bit expensive, but it does come with a mini arcade stick that you can plug into it, you know, and, it, you know, it's portable and it comes with a charging kit and all this kind of stuff. Um, and it does have 1943 built into it as well, which is really cool, which was, you know, some would say was the sequel was better. There was a lot more. There was more, you know, power, power-ups and stuff like that in the game. But I think they did a good choice in kind of, going for the 1942 aesthetic of it and having the, the wood panelling and, you know, like the original arcade cabinet and everything like that. But you were looking online as well, weren't you, Dan? And there's there's a lot of mixed feelings about the actual cabinet itself, isn't there? Yeah, well, I mean, this is um, a company called New Wave Toys. And we have mm. talked about them before when they did that. Um, it was a Dragon's Lair mm. um, replica that they did a while ago, which, um, you know, looked very cool. Um, pricing of them, I think, what was this, about $120? $150, um, $149.99. $150 this one, yeah. It kind of silently came out, because, I mean, this has been on the market by the looks of it for a couple of weeks now. First, mm. I'd heard of it um, when Ravi found this today. Um, and again, I'm reading reviews here that say it looks really good. You know, it's definitely got that aesthetic that reminds you of the original system. But there is a review here on um, a website called Game Tyrant that I'll link up in our show notes. And it's saying, actually, when you get a bit closer, it's a bit cheap and plasticky, plasticky looking. And the back of it hasn't got much attention, you know, it kind of looks like they've cheaped out a bit on that. But also the fact that it's got some um, HDMI problems as well. He's talking oh, about really? the fact he's tried to hook it up to a bigger screen TV and uh, apparently the the display keeps cutting out and it takes a few attempts to get it displaying. Could just be an issue with his individual unit, but he's saying the actual screen is so small, you know, being that little 10-inch cabinet that really the only way that he can play it comfortably is by hooking it up to a bigger screen TV and actually using the controller rather than the one that's on the cabinet. So in many ways, it kind of feels like it's more of a something you're going to buy and just put on your shelf as a decoration, mm. I imagine, rather than playing it. But yeah, I mean, it looks amazing, I've got to say. But um, yeah, I think there are probably better ways to play 1942 if you're a fan of the original yeah. game. Um, something here, though, that might help you with your uh, retro gaming habit. This is... Um, a company called um, Analog, who obviously we've covered them quite a bit in the past as well, who want to build the definitive operating system for retro gaming. Now, this is quite a cool idea. I was looking into this, and this was absolutely everywhere. With with um, Analog, all their kind of stuff seems to go everywhere, and, you know, they're really good at promotion and stuff. And they've created the uh, Analog NT before, and uh, the Analog Pocket, which is a cool little retro gaming device. Um uh, which kind of does Game Boy games and tons of different ones. Now this is this is a library, um, but the way that the library works is, you know, you'd actually put your game in, and then the OS will find information about that game. So it will probably read the ROM or the code that's within the game, and uh, link to that like hex file and uh, withdraw information off the internet or or off databases that it has about that Kind of like title. Plex does with IMDb. Yeah, yeah. But like, you know, you actually put it in and it will be like, right, this is your rare stadium events games. And here's all the info about stadium events. And it also enables you to um, save setups within there as well. So if you have like on some systems, because I'm assuming this is going to come out on all of the analog systems, it enables you to have save states already connected with that game um if you have bluetooth controllers as well um it would like automatically select the bluetooth and the key maps that you've already put in there so it, it becomes a huge kind of index and you can also share a playlist as well so you can share with your friends you know a list of what titles you've been playing and it, it's quite nice it's like it's adding extra features to those 
original carts and giving you more information like uh, box art and uh, user sets uh, that other users are using and di- different ways to play the game as well. Quite quite like, you know, um, if you played Steam and mm. uh, you have different user profiles for games like uh, for the control systems and stuff like that, um, you know, and it, and, and it kind of adds a little bit of extra life to the game um, as it goes on. They're hoping that people are going to add to this and it's going to become like a kind of default base for for kind of games and information and uh, everybody using their different systems, like putting a cart into the uh, analog NT or, you know, their their, um, Nintendo clone and uh, or their Mega Drive clone or whichever system they're doing um, will then be connected to this and kind of adding to the database as well. Yeah, and the saying as well, if you, you know, for example, you find something weird at a, you know, a yard sale, you can put that information into your pocket and it'll find out what version of the game is, you know, is it, um, how rare it is, is it once in a lifetime, find the saying here as well. And also you can get all the rare different versions that, you know, you might find in uh, torrents and that kind of thing and promotional versions of the game. So it will help you track down specific reg- regions or versions of games as well as revisions that might be quite rare. So it does sound like they're building a massive database, essentially, that you could you can find anything you want to know about these games on there. Yeah, kind of like maybe a, a Wikipedia of gaming or something that mm, uh, is built into know, the system. Yeah, that people contribute to, and then I guess the more people that use it, the better it will get, and the more accurate it will get, and the more unusual titles that will be played on it and stuff. But they need to sell the hardware as well, and I hope that they have like dedicated team members actually kind of working on this OS because. You can imagine there can be a lot of errors and stuff and there can be a lot of similarities. But also, I guess maybe you could have stuff like different language versions of games and uh, stuff that would add into that or, or tell you what, what's kind of available on that special about that car and, uh, you know, what, having the Japanese version, why, why that's special. Because a lot of their devices also um, play multi-region carts as well. It sounds, you know, like a massive project. Um, and they reckon that the, the analog pocket is going to be kind of the first place that we'll see this analog OS. It's going to kind of be the showcase of it. But yeah, I mean, because there is all this, all this information is obviously out there if you know where to find it. But you guys are probably the same. I mean, if you want to find out something about a game, you know, particularly, again, it's not that common. Sometimes going through threads on forums and tweets, you know, there can be so much conflicting information out there. And even Wikipedia, I mean, not everything's on Wikipedia, but even that can be wrong, you know, a lot of the time. It's actually having, especially if it's kind of, you know, community verified information, having it all in one place, that could be quite a valuable service, I think. What, what do you think about it, Joe? Because you're going to be one of the kind of, like, people that would really be into this if, if it was with Game Boy games and stuff like that. I, I really like the idea that you mentioned about, like, the different variants of the games. Because, you know, especially in trying to think of some games off the top of my head right now, but like Splatterhouse for the TurboGrafx-16 and Splatterhouse 2 for the Mega Drive and stuff. You know, the Japanese, the Americans, the PAL region games had different graphical things in it, depending on what region you lived in, like, you know, different censorships and stuff in the games. And like with Streets of Rage and then the Japanese version, Bare Knuckle, like with Streets of Rage 3 and Bare Knuckle 3, they were loads of different like censorships in the game, you know, when they got ported over to the other countries. So it'd be really interesting to just to, to have that all in one place in one massive library. You know, like Dan says, sometimes it's not easy. I mean, those games are common games that people know about, but it's cool sometimes to just kind of be able to flick through that on a database. Like I know the Mega Drive Mini was really good for that. Like you could play the different Japanese and PAL versions, like you could flick through it on the Mega Drive Mini, but that's like, what, 50 games? Yeah. If you had that on like 10,000 games, you know, obviously I know not every game's got a variant but you know a lot of retro games do so i think that'd be really cool and you know it's yes. kind of kind of similar to us like you know what, what we're trying to do with you know archiving this kind of stuff so it's out there on the internet it's, it's very similar to that as well well they need to have a link so you put a game in and then the developer pops up on a retro hour interview and you can listen yeah to the interview. <laughs> there you go <laughs> there you go <laughs> that <is it> Ravi. <laughs> you, console, you found the usb yeah. so uh yeah i mean that, that could it could be a system seller you know for um these little analog devices, you know, if, if it gets big enough, I think. So um, I'll link up that article in our show notes, along with everything else at theretrohour.com. Now, just before we chat to uh, Dino Dini, um, what about this? This could be the most ambitious Game Boy game that we've ever talked about on this show. In fact, 
a Game Boy game that requires two separate cartridges. This this game is absolutely mental. There's so much to kind of explain about this game. Um, it's pretty mad. Um, Joe, have you have you had a little look at this one? Yeah. So this is shape the Shapeshifter Two. So this is the second game in the Shapeshifter trilogy, um, which have all been done by uh, a solo developer called Green Boy Games. Um, so the first game came out on the Game Boy and the NES, but this is the second game, obviously, and he's putting it out on Game Boy. But apparently this is the first ever Game Boy game that's going to be released on two cartridges to play. Now, I'm not too sure how that under- how, like, how that works. Like, I've been reading into it and I've, I've not got to that part yet, but like, I don't know if you know, Ravi, but like... Yeah, it, it, it seems pretty mad. It's like quite smart, actually. Um, it's, it's Adventure Codes. So okay. The, the whole idea of it is that because it's it's like, it's, a, it's like a Monkey Island adventure game, isn't it? Like yeah, kind of. Yeah. But it's like also like one of those choose your own adventure books. Yeah, yeah, know, yeah. You'd go around and you get different chapters and stuff. Where one of the cartridges will produce a code, and I've got here, um, Lovebird would would appear on the one cartridge, and then you get the second cartridge, and you'd enter that code to kind of branch to that point um so you're not actually it's the, the game boy is not saving anything in memory you're just getting to one point on one cartridge and then yeah. that, that trigger word lovebird uh you take the cartridge out and you put the other one in and you type lovebird into that and it would like mean that this the story continues um, got you the kind of adventure continues i think it's quite a smart little way of uh, of kind of linking them together and, and I guess getting a lot more game out of it because the whole idea of this game is uh, that, that you, you're a shapeshifter and you, any yeah. animal that you touch, you you change into. So they're going to have yeah. a lot and of animals in there. And then that's to like solve the puzzles. You know, you know, I was watching the trailer earlier on, he becomes a beaver and then he can go somewhere where the beaver can go <laughs> after he touches the beaver, which I thought was quite funny. But they've absolutely smashed their Kickstarter goal Um you know, I think it only launched on the 16th of October. So at the point of recording three days ago. And right now they're on $57,000 of initial goal of $7,000. So absolutely smashed it. So there must be a lot of love for the first, for the first shapeshifter game that you did. And it seems like it's all mini games here as well. So like with the different animals and there's like, mm. I think there's about 12 that I'm seeing here or something. It's quite an epic amount. Um, It's like mole digs holes in the ground and then a chameleon you're the king of disguise but also daisy you just decorate the grass if you're a daisy (laughs) a rock you can be a rock hard as a rock a dream come (laughs) true (laughs) and i've got to say you know graphically the animation on this looks incredible it's jaw-dropping for the game boy the amount of detail in here there's there's like pixel art like it's the only way i could describe it but like some of the uh character panels you know like kind of like when they're talking to you and stuff like that just look unreal like i can't believe the amount of detail that they've got into this game like i mean i know we've come a long way since like the game boy came out in 1989 and it's over two cartridges but it looks unreal like it looks so good and it's coming out on a physical cartridge as yeah well you can get yeah, all yeah, of, or yeah. a rom you know if you just want a, a rom to play but um yeah you know the box art and everything it looks amazing it looks like they might have like a code wheel or something in there as well yeah <laughs> At the packaging, so that real old school adventure feel. I love adventure games anyway, so um, yeah, this would be definitely something I'd be up for. And uh, like you said, I mean, it's only a couple of days into this Kickstarter, already extremely popular, but if you want to get involved in that, I'll put that in our show notes at theretrohour.com. Now, let's just take a quick moment to give a huge thank you to another big supporter of the Retro Hour podcast. And this is, of course, the wonderful crew at Retro Gamer magazine. Now, Retro Gamer, of course, the essential read every single month. If you like our show, no doubt about it, you have to read Retro Gamer magazine. They cover so much in there. Uh, And in fact, this month, it is a real celebration of um, an incredible game that I can't believe is 20 years old at the moment. This is... Super Monkey Ball. They've got a really in-depth celebration of uh, Sega's fantastic party game and find out all about the new remaster and the history of the game as well. Uh, were you a fan of that game back in the day, Joe? Yeah, I really liked Super Monkey Ball, but what really scared me then uh, was when you said this game is 20 years old. Super Mario World came to my mind, which mm. is 30 years old, which <laughs> made me feel really old. So yeah, 
I, I touched on it at the start of the episode then that these games are now retro from when we started, but that sounds awesome. Like the complete, what is it? It's like the complete history of Super Monkey Ball. Yeah. That's Who would you play, guy. Joe? Ultimate guy. Who did I play? I played the big guy. Of course I did. Oh, you know, Gon-Gon, because there yeah, was I, I, me, me, baby and Gon-Gon. I was going to say, these are the big guy or the baby. Yeah, man. All the way. <laughs> well, they cover loads of stuff in Retro Gamer every month as well. Not only have you got that, you've also got the making of Theme Park as well. That was um, one of my favourite Bullfrog games back in the day. That was so much fun. Ramp up the, um, what was it? Ramp up the salt on the drinks and then they yeah, end up yeah. buying loads, but then they all puke everywhere. So you've got salt on the fries. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was it, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> At Mortal Kombat 2 as well. They've actually, it, it's really interesting actually. They're talking about um, Mortal Kombat 2 memories and kind of uh, <laughs> the harsh lessons that that game taught you back in the day. And also, um, you know, talking about game cheats and stuff and how you learn stuff on Mortal Kombat 2 back in the day. Um, they've also got stuff like um, a report on the Famicom here as well, how Metal Slug 3 pushed the limits of the Neo Geo back in the day, a collector's guide about the Mega CD. You know, if you've got games in your collection, these are going up in value all the time as well. And a nice little feature on the Sega Nomad. But actually, you know, the Nomad, that's something that I've looked at at retro gaming shows before, and I've had it on and I thought, God, that looks really cool. I wouldn't mind I, getting I, I've drooled over those, especially the ones where they've done the uh, new muck wheel mods as well and uh, you know i never really knew about the nomads back in the day so it'd be really nice to actually read about them yeah and if you're thinking of um maybe some uh, retro gaming uh, related gifts obviously christmas only a few weekends away now which is crazy and they also do like um a retro gaming roundup as well collector's guide and things that you should be looking out for if you want to treat yourself as well uh, they do great little conferences where the team all get together i love that collector's corner as well where they focus on um, different people's retro gaming collections and talk about their their jewels in the crown and you know it's really interesting community feel to the magazine too so if you don't read retro gamer already or maybe just pick it up from the supermarket when you're out why don't you make sure that you get it every month and support our podcast and actually if you take up this offer not only will you get a subscription to retro gamer magazine magazine but also you will get a free controller either an n64 tribute or a mega drive bluetooth controller now you can pick which one you want the mega drive bluetooth controller works with windows mac raspberry pi ios and switch and the tribute 64 one is available in either usb form or you can use it with a classic n64 port and really you get you know a much better controller for the original n64 oh they they look beautiful i really love that mega drive one and the fact that it kind of works on pretty much everything there you know yeah. windows mac raspberry pi ios and switch that's like wow you know uh i i actually really need one of those at the moment so i'm going to take them up on this deal well we did say before about you know the fact those switch games you know the uh, n64 mega drive games the launch next week you know perfect for that as well if you're going to play the uh, switch online with those so subscribe today to retro gamer magazine and choose your free retro controller all you have to do is go to magazinesdirect.com forward slash retropod and if you're already subscribed i mean you could gift the mag to somebody else and keep the controller for yourself and you'll get six months of retro gamer with the retro controller absolutely free support the retro hour by taking up this incredible offer at magazinesdirect.com slash retropod and a big thank you to our friends at retro gamer for their continued support now if you've been a patron you'd have been treated to um, a bit of extra content over the last few minutes wouldn't you you would have been. You would have definitely been. You know what you would have also been tweeted to? Our very, very sexy After Hours episode that came out this week as well. Yes, which um, we went back to the year 1998 and we did um, just over an hour sharing our memories and talking about the, the technology and gaming that came out in that year. You know, often when we do these kind of retro years episodes of the After Hours podcast, I don't actually realise quite how much happens in that year till we start researching it. I'm like, my God, that was... You know, it, it makes like... Modern years just feel like totally quiet. <laughs> you know, if you look at what happened in like 98, 99, 2000. Yeah, I was really worried that I wouldn't have much to talk about because of, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't want to be like, oh, I was only like nine years old. But I was a bit like, oh, God, like I'm not going to have loads to talk about. But you couldn't shut me up, to be honest. So <laughs> well, the so, movies alone that came out. Yeah. Fantastic. So um, if you want to get access to that, we do it every month our patrons exclusive podcast, The Retro Hour After Hours, which is now up to um, episode number 17. If you're back as on Patreon as a gold member or above, you get access to that each month. Everybody gets the usual podcast early most weeks. You get it ad-free as well. You get extra patrons exclusive content in there. I think last week, not only did they get an extra story, but about 10 minutes extra on the interview. It was about 15 minutes of extra retro hour goodness that our patrons got last week too. But also, you'll be able to watch episode 300 of this podcast live 
as we record it next weekend. So if you want to see me picking my nose. <laughs> see my retro you, boxer shorts. <laughs> Ravi and his retro boxer shorts and Dan trying to put fires out. <laughs> putting it all together now i'm joking i'm really really looking forward to it it's gonna go fine joe don't be nervous (laughs) so uh we are gonna do really it's gonna be a fly on the wall so we're gonna put a camera up in the corner of this studio the lads are coming over here in my new studio first time we've actually recorded a show in person together for almost like two years now um, which is gonna be amazing fun uh gonna be joined by a bunch of special guests you know that our patrons know about but we'll announce maybe on the main podcast next week and you're gonna really enjoy it it's just gonna be a celebration of this show we're gonna get a load of you guys on as well hopefully so it's gonna be a complete giggle if you want to get involved in the show as we record it backers on patreon everyone will get access to that and also you can come to our monthly patron hangouts as well um we did one of those last weekend and that was i think probably our best one yet Oh, yeah, they're getting better and better, aren't they? Someone tweeted afterwards, I think it was Gideon uh, Tebbett, and he said, um, you know, it's it's like a pub meetup, and it's getting more and more mm. like that, where we're all just sitting around a giant table chatting about retro stuff. It's really good. Yeah, so we do that every month as well. All patrons are welcome to that. So really doing it, though, to support this podcast, if you can just, you know, spare a couple of quid, a couple of dollars, a couple of euros a month, it all goes back into the running cost of this show and really, really helps us out. And it will ensure that this show will continue past episode 300 and into 2022. And, of course, you will get a mention in the most prestigious high score table in the world of retro gaming. It is the Retro Hour Hall of Fame. And a big shout this week to some of our latest supporters, Nut Eltiset, King Diesel, Marcus Benson, Rene Cabalos, and Matt Godbolt, who all backed us on Patreon. We hugely appreciate your support. And if you'd like to do the same, head onto our website at theretrohour.com. All the details are on there. While we're talking about supporting the show, we appreciate not everyone can back us on Patreon, but if you would like to do something to help us out, Leave a little review on um, your podcast client of choice. You know, gives a, a five star rating on Spotify, or if you can leave a text review on Apple Podcasts. I think um, our last one was in September, so we haven't had one for almost a month. They really help the show out and help us uh, get into the podcast chart. And uh, one day we will overtake Gardener's Question Time, I'm sure, uh, with your help. But if you'd uh, just take a couple of minutes, that will really, really help us out, and obviously it won't cost you anything. However, you help out the show, we really appreciate it. And of course, we'll keep bringing you incredible guests every week. Like this week, we talk kickoff with the legendary Dino Dini, and he's next on the Retro Hour podcast. You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast, and it is time for the highlight of the show when we welcome on our very special guest. And today, we are absolutely honoured to be joined by a veteran of the industry and anyone that loves football video games is going to know our guest today let's welcome to the show the wonderful dino dini how are you doing dino very good thank you i'm blushing <laughs> well listen really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us obviously you know massive fans of kickoff and we'll get into that very soon just a bit of background on you though i mean um where, where did you grow up i know you've got a, an italian background is that right yeah both my parents are um, italian so they moved to the uk um shortly before i was born and uh my father um, went to work at a, a com- I think it was submarine cables. So it's, it, the irony there was he was working on on you know the laying of, of the technology behind undersea cabling. Uh, so that was a big thing back then, which would be like fifty six ish years ago. And then of course over the years uh, that have gradually got phased out because you know uh, we went to uh, satellite technology and 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 radio technology and so on. But the irony is, is that it, it, it came back again. Uh, so if if my father was working now, he'd be working on internet uh, undersea cables. But uh, yeah, so he he got um, his doctorate from the University of Pisa, and then he f- found a job in the UK, and they came over. So and then I was born in London. It's pretty um, amazing. Uh, I've I've mentioned before to people that you know the internet's through cables under the sea and uh you know a lot of people are just absolutely amazed and they're like they they don't believe it's still kind of just a a giant line essentially yeah in the end it's because it's still it came back full circle as being the the best way to get really high bandwidth communication and um reliable communication so yeah it, it is it is quite amazing so yeah so he was working in testing the components if i remember rightly in his lab 
because they obviously you lay down these things uh, and they've got to last a long time, right? So the QA on the components that go into building the electronics, because the thing to understand is, is that you can't just lay a cable from one side of the Atlantic to the other as just one cable. You have to have repeaters along the way. So you have to have boxes with electronics in them to boost the signal every so often because otherwise it won't work. So he was testing the components that went under the sea. So simulating, you know, how long they would last and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. I, I was I was wondering then, what was your first kind of computer experience or your first exposure to computers really? Yeah, I, if I, as I remember, I was into electronics like from about five or so. Computers weren't really an option. They were just things I read about in books from the library. I remember reading about magnetic core memory. It gives you an idea because, I mean, that's so obsolete. Um, it was a, it was a major thing. It's like little little beads of ferrite fed, with wires fed through that would be magnetized. Each bit is a tiny piece of <laughs> tiny bead. I remember reading about all of that. But I mean, you know, home computers didn't exist or anything. But then when I was about twelve or so, um, I started trying to build a computer using uh 6800 microprocessor and it was a lot of work and i didn't i only got so far and then there was the acorn atom no acorn system one sorry yeah so that's acorn released a micro what we'd call a microcontroller today and uh it was made with two pcbs the lower one was you know cpu memory rom uh, peripheral input output devices the kinds of things that you know, if, if anybody is uh, programming an Arduino, if that's the right way to pronounce it, or those PIC, PIC miniature microprocessors that you get all in one chip. So it's basically the same as one of those, only it's a whole PCB, not that big, uh, about six inches by about four. Mm. And there were two layers of this. The top one was the keyboard and display, and the display was a eight-digit, seven-segment calculator display. And so and you had to program it with in, in machine code, obviously, because uh, there were no compilers. What would you run it on? Uh, <laughs> and, uh, um, yeah, that's where I started. Uh, that was the first computer I owned, and I, I actually started writing games for that. Um, that's really interesting. Because I've looked into the background of that machine before and actually read it. We had Steve Ferber, you know, from Acorn on the show. Um, last oh, cool. year, and he was talking about. I think it was based on like a, an automated cow feeder or something. That's where <laughs> the technology actually <laughs> originated from. So it was yeah, probably it was, yeah. I mean, there was the I, I can't remember her name, but it was um, it was actually designed. Was, was it Kay? I can't remember her name now. Sophie you, you Wilson. Design. Sophie, that's it. Sophie yeah. Wilson. I just couldn't remember. But yeah, they they um, they built a, a prototype. I think the prototype still exists. But uh, yeah, I, I would have to thank Sophie very much because that was the first computer I ever owned. And um, it was, I learned an awful lot, um, a lot of frustration as well. Uh, but you know what, when you, <laughs> when you figured out, when you figured out what was wrong and you got, you got your thing to work, it was, it was incredibly satisfying. Well, how did you start programming that machine? I mean, were you learning it from magazines? Did you have a local users group? How, how were you kind of figuring it, it out? Was, well, it was so cutting edge at that point. I mean, eventually there were, you know, you, I suppose there, there were magazines eventually, but I got the Acorn System 1 almost out the gate that it was being produced. So all I had was the manual. Uh, and uh, actually, you could still get a, a printing of the manual. And uh, I lost the original System 1, but I, I managed to get one off eBay and, and it needed to be repaired. <laughs> but I managed to do that about, finish that about a few months ago. But I actually tried programming it again. I was, um, I was, I was trying to make an endless, endless run. I actually streamed uh, me doing, doing that. I'll get back to it again. But yeah, you just, uh, you had the manual and uh, the, it, it, the manual consisted of um, basically the instruction codes for the 6502 microprocessor and then some information on the electronic circuit tree of the, the whole unit plus the ROM uh, subroutines for, for displaying keyboard input and so on. And um, yeah, 1K of RAM and the 6502 being the way it is, is a quarter of that is your stack and then another quarter of it is your you know fast memory and so mm. in practice, you could cheat and squeeze more out of it, but in practice you had uh, 
uh, half a K for your program. And uh, yeah, to save that on cassette tape, of course, 300 board. It's crazy 1K. You wouldn't even get a, a mouse cursor into 1K today. Uh, yeah, I doubt it. Yeah, <laughs> uh, you would. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, but don't get me started on that. I just <laughs> bloat, bloat on in, in software uh, is a thing that, as time goes on, I get more and more irritated by it. Frankly, um, mm. it, it's utterly shocking. Did you do you ever play the game um, Star Raiders? Well, Star Raiders came out on the Atari eight hundred and yeah. four hundred, and then the one thirty XE. Um, it was nineteen seventy eight or nine. Uh, it's for me one of the best games ever made. It's just it's got so much in it that you can learn from that is relevant to games now. It was 8K, 8K cartridge. You know, they're still alive, that particular spirit, the spirit that manages to achieve like a a, a game, a classic game like that in such a small amount of memory. That's still there in the demo scene. But what I find a bit of a shame is that people in the demo scene don't often cross over. They don't seem to cross over with games much. I mean, there, there are examples, but... Often they're, they're making these incredible demos, and you wonder how did they manage to create all of that, like in one K or whatever. And uh, it's basically the necessity is the mother of invention, as they say. And it's it's kind of like they're now setting themselves limits because they've got, um, you know, they could just go completely wild. So that they, they've set themselves limits, and it's uh, doing it within that, you know, certain amount of K. Yeah, that's absolutely right. But the irony is that often under those constraints, they end up producing things which stand on their own merit. You don't see the demos and think, well, sometimes you do. You don't see the demos always or generally and think, oh, what's amazing about this is that it fit into, you know, 1K, 2K of memory. It's just they're often amazing anyway. And that's just icing on the cake. And um, in some ways, more creative. And that that fits in with the kind of philosophy, I think, that constraints are the, the mother of invention, <laughs> or the mother of creativity, let's put it that way. Constraints are the mother of, of creativity. When you, when you give somebody a, uh, all the technology, all the options, uh, no constraints at all, um, then things seem to sort of dribble on and not really end up often, you know, not really end up particularly inspired. I could, yeah, I could name I could name certain projects, but I won't. <laughs> so I mean, getting back to obviously you have the Acom System One, and then did you kind of move into another machine? And what kind of projects were you working on before you entered the industry professionally? Were you making games at home and for friends? What were you kind of doing? Well, well for, so the System One, there was no commercial, real commercial option for that because uh, there really wasn't much of an industry. Uh, actually, if I'd got a um, an Atari 400 or 800, much more expensive, and that was from America. Um, there might have been. The, the system that I got after that, though, was the Acorn Atom, which is obviously also an Acorn machine. That was based on 6502, 1 megahertz, and you could expand it to 6K of memory, which cost quite a bit at the time to expand it to mm. 6. So I, that, was, uh, that was a marvellous one because it, it had a TV display, of course, with, with some limitations, but you could do graphics on it. And that was my first sort of commercial platform in the sense that 19, around 1980, there was a company called Time Data, uh, and they published some software that is still around in, in the, emu- you know, the emulation on, on the Acorn Atom. And um, they made a book called the Acorn Atom Magic Book. And... Uh, there are a few listings in there, a few listings, because that was back in the times so that you would type in the program from a, a print a printout. And those are my first commercial sort of games in there. Didn't get a huge amount of money for that, but I got something. And from there, I went on to the BBC Micro, which, of course, is you know legendary. That was an amazing machine. Uh, so I did a game called Astro Tracker, which is kind of like a clone of asteroids ish um and that was published by bbug and that was a step up uh from from the uh, the magic book and um after that there was uh i made uh, i made a game for the atari 400 that never got published but that was built right. on in, in, with an eprom 
it got a bit quiet after that because at that point then I went to, uh, you know, went to university. It was coming out of university and then getting a job out of university. I went to work at a uh, silica shop in... Um, right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. From, the, 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 still there the, in the magazines, you get the adverts from the old silica shop. Oh, I used to drool over those adverts as a kid. They looked incredible. <laughs> they were, well, they, they're based in Sidcup. And I was uh, mm. based in Bexley. I was actually not far away at all from, from the silica shop, as it happened. So that's the, the connection there. I actually went to uni in a, in a Sidcup. But, um, you but, did? Yeah, yeah. Um, silica shop, was that then the original silica shop? Because I know it turned into an absolutely huge brand with uh, lots of stores nationwide. They changed their name a bit when that happened. I, I, that, I was, this was way before. I was, I was involved there when there were basically the shop in Sidcup plus a warehouse. And I would work in the warehouse repairing Atari STs. Well, but that was a bit of a jump forward. Yeah, definitely. Like, um, how how did you end up getting involved with um, Anil Gupta and um, Anko then? And uh, uh, I was I was looking for publishers because I after working at the, at the Silica Shop for I don't know a year or, or two, and I was young and a bit weird, as I think most of us are when we. I look back at myself then I go what, but um, I was I was I wanted to get back into doing games because i had done them before going to uni and then and I, so i just had this job repairing out atari st computers so i was looking at you know the companies that we were repairing atari st computers for and so one of them was was anko so it was in dartford so it was nearby which was the main criteria <laughs> you know and um I, I went to so i went and visited them and and uh, that was anil and i said Okay, I I want to I can program games. I can do that. So he he tried me out on a, a game called Trivia Tro- Trivia Trove, which was a, a game on the Amiga and he wanted a port to the ST. So I did my own sort of take on it, porting, you know, making a version of that game on the Atari ST. And that went very well and was pretty quick. I pr- pr- probably was paid a pittance for it. And then after that, you know, well, he said, what next? And he said, you know, football games are not very good. And uh, I remember my heart sank a bit because I was all into space games. So right. I still have, you know, because of Elite, mm. you know, those influences from the te- your teenager, you know. I must have been, what, eight, was I 18, 19, I, I, something like that, late teens when Elite came out and the BBC Micro. Uh, that was awesome. What were the Anko officers like then? Um, I hear it was just kind of a house and, uh, you know, packaging in one room and stuff, and it was just uh, quite oh, small. Well, when, I, when I joined, it was pretty much. I can't really remember the outside of it, funnily enough. I can only remember the inside, and it felt like a house. It was. I didn't work in the office there. I worked at home and pretty without an advance, actually. It was kind of it was crazy, crazy days. So the development of kickoff was actually done without any funding, <laughs> which sounds ridiculous. But that, those are the those are the cowboy days, weren't they? So uh, and there was there was Steve Screech and some other people, and Anil wasn't doing so well. I mean, around the time that I came along, I think they were putting out strip poker, which is uh, is it's always. There's always a sign when a, a, a development <laughs> company uh, starts resorting to that kind of thing. Yeah, I, I, I don't think that would work these days. Um, <laughs> it, be- it barely worked then, to be honest. Well, to, yes, <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, I, yeah, I, was, I developed. I, I was developing that at home. So I'd, I used to go into the office, and then he had a shop as well. And the, the shop was a little down the road. It was just like a computer shop and so on. But he used to sell his own games in there. So you know that was probably useful to him for getting like you know feedback from the from the customers about things. Mm. So it's really it was an unlikely kind of pairing on a certain level, but it's like I went with the flow, and usually I find that when I go with the flow, uh, it, things work out work out better. Actually, um, kickoff and it was a real revolution. I mean, I remember playing you know earlier games like um, international soccer on the Commodore sixty four. We played that quite a bit at home. I mean, were you a fan of? Any other football games before that that kind of inspired it? Or how did you go about actually developing it? And were there any challenges or highlights you remember? 
obviously the first, you know, uh, I, I remember looking at a game. It was your generic how football games are done at that time game. And it, it was side on and with a small pitch and with huge sprites. And I just looked at it and went, just that's just just silly. It's all wrong, but that's the way they were. And in in a way, it's the way they a lot of games. Well, maybe they've got a bit better now, but there is a tendency to go that way. It's a little more complicated because we're in three D and so on. But mm. it's like forgetting that the experience of uh, football heavily depends on the size of the pitch. But you see, if you want to make a game where the characters of the the actual players themselves. This is especially true if you're doing 2D, right? You want to make them big on the screen, then you're going. If you keep the pitch to scale, then you're going to end up with um, not being able to see any of the pitch. I mean, because you're only going to see a tiny part of the pitch. So what they did was they they had the big uh, football player characters, and then they made the pitch really small. So it felt more like you know five aside, an overcrowded five aside. I looked at that. I wasn't particularly particularly keen on it. I think I was about the only one I looked at because I, te- I tend to work at, I tend to work in in what, an isolation, but I limit my influences from outside because I find that they can pull you. It can pull you and drag you in sort of odd directions that are not necessarily the best, especially if you want to innovate. So what I did was I looked. The scale was wrong, so that was one criteria that I wanted to fix. The other one was um, I was always passionate ever since working on the Acorn Atom, uh, passionate to have totally smooth movement that you only get when you're running at 50 FPS for PAL, 60 for NTSC. Mm. But um, you only get perfectly smooth movement if you're animating everything that quickly, right? And that's what I wanted. So what you've got then is it needs to be fast it needs to have beta scale, so it really had to be overhead because um, I, I really didn't see any other way of achieving those two requirements. So that's why it became an overhead fo- um, football game. And it was um, incredibly fast as well. Like, um, did, did you kind of do some assembly coding then and, and did you really have to optimise it to get that speed? Because uh, kickoffs always had that, like status as being a really really fast game and uh, once you get quick at it it can be a uh, incredibly fast the way that the ball travels across the pitch yeah it's uh i think i did a calculation once and that the if you were to compare it to real players i think they three times faster than real life yeah they must have been very fit those sprites <laughs> yeah <laughs> but part of the argument with that is that you're trying to compress a, a 90 minute game into you can't play for 90 minutes, right? Yeah. So uh, it's still a compromise. If you were to <laughs> compress 90 minutes into 10 minutes, then you'd be, well, nine times faster. So uh, that would probably be unplayable. So it's taking a license with reality because you can't recreate reality. You, you just can't with a football game. Not if people are going to, unless people are going to spend 90 minutes uh, playing playing the match, right? So I think I was part was deliberate to try and sort of speed speed it up. The other aspect of speed is, is just the smoothness in which the game updates, because you can also make the game update like half as much, like 30 or uh, 25 frames per second. And that's kind of independent of how fast things move. But if you try to make things move quickly at a lower frame rate, it gets harder to actually track the motion with your eyes and, and, and so on. And it just doesn't look as nice. So the, the real thing from a technical optimization point of view was trying to get the scrolling pitch, the 22 players on the field with AI running, which had to be team-based at AI, obviously, in some way, running on the pitch, running all together, uh, at uh, 50 FPS, 50 frames per second. And that could not be done in any other way other than assembler, really. I could, plus, if I'd written it in C, I, I wouldn't have got it into the memory either because there's memory constraints as well. So back then, then pretty much all games uh, of that era were written in assembler. That was just the standard. And um, 
various uh, optimizing techniques that are used. I mean, it was it also helped that the sixty eight thousand was the the microprocessor that the ST and the Amiga had, and um, they're really wonderful to work with because they've got lots of registers, and you can do tricks where you hold important uh, addresses in memory. You point to important places in memory, holding it in a register that nothing touches. And so there's really fast access to that information. And so I would have one uh, address was pointing to the home team data, another one pointing to the away team data, and then there was another that pointed to the current player that was being processed. So all of the routines for the, the player all had very fast access to you know, their data without needing to sort of unload and reload registers and so on. So it was, it was basically built from the ground up with an architecture that was meshed with the needs of the game. And that's one reason why it got that fast. Then there were a few other tricks as well, you know, things like no need to animate players that you're off the screen. So there's kinds of those kinds of tricks. And then, um, unfortunately, when all the players are on the pitch, or on the screen, I should say, they're all on the pitch, but when they're all on the screen, 22 mm. players, they couldn't do it. Certainly the ST couldn't do it. I don't think the Amiga could handle it either because it just overloads the – it's too much, right? Um, yeah. So I used a further trick there, which is when that happens, it keeps drawing the, the pitch at 50 FPS, but it time slices the players, and the ball is also 50 FPS, but it time slices the players. So the players don't move as quickly. Ah, right. Interesting. So if you've ever played the game and you noticed, that's weird. There's a corner kick. And out of looking at it, the players seem to jitter. If you've ever noticed that, mm. it's, be- yeah. it's, it's the uh, optimization kicking in because it just can't. Uh, it would actually check to see real time uh, how much time it had left. And if it said, I'm running out of time, it would time slice them. So yeah, it's an ingenious workaround, though. That must did, did it take a long time to come up with that then? Or uh, I, I had uh, fortunately I had done hacking on the BBC Micro on the horizontal blank. It actually wasn't that tricky because I'd done it before. On the on the BBC Micro it was a different thing. It's moving sprites around, and uh, you know tearing. Yeah, probably yeah. every. The, I mean, these days your options for dealing with these things are incredibly restricted because the hardware is all in pipelines and all locked down and and so but on the i on this bbc micro i had a game called bandits and so i had to move a bunch of sprites around the screen and you know it's a similar kind of problem um but i couldn't wait for the v blank for the vertical blank i needed to draw the sprites as the tv is drawing the picture and so when you do that there's a problem that in order to move a, a sprite they would moved by clearing them and then drawing them you clear them and then you draw them okay well the problem is there's a short amount of time when they are cleared and not yet drawn and if you clear it and then the beam from the tv you know draws what isn't there and then after it's passed you put it back on the screen then for one frame or more because it beats you know like wagon wheels thing you you end up with it disappearing because it's actually there but just disappears the moment when the tv's drawing it yeah so um what i did with that to get around this is it would check the vertical sorry the horizontal blank on an interrupt which was possible to do in the bbc micro it could tell where the beam was and if it was too close it'd say well if i move this now it's going to disappear so just wait until the beam has gone past and then draw it. I was very proud. Uh, my headphone has just popped out. Um, I was very proud of that. Yeah, and it, you know, like like you said before, you know, the, the limitations force you to think of creative ways to get around them. Um, yeah, definitely added to the game. I think. What one other design decision as well that I thought was interesting about kickoff is, you know, a lot of the time football games, then the the ball stuck to the player's feet, and it was very unrealistic. You, you decided not to go with the sticky ball and make it more realistic. I mean, was that another? design decision that you wanted to get in there? Well, again, when I looked at the other games, I said, I mean, didn't everybody else see it? This is a bit I, I don't understand, actually. It's like everybody else looking at football games. Did they not immediately see that the ball sticks to the player? It'd be interesting if they do a survey, you know, people who mm. played games before kickoff, 
football games before kickoff, if it ever bothered them. I don't know, but it bothered me. I'm looking and going, but that's silly. You might as it's like carrying the ball. It's, functionally, there's no difference. You might draw the ball at the foot, but it makes no. It's effectively the same as carrying the ball, and the game is called football because you move the ball around with your feet. So if the ball is stuck to the player, you've actually defeated the whole point of football. Yeah. And so I said, no, uh, I think we need to do this as a, a physics simulation. So the first thing I did was make the ball, bouncing of the ball, and um, made that feel good, which meant I needed to put air friction in. You try and make a, a, um, a football game without air friction. What you'll find is that, you know, a player can kick the ball from one end of the field and uh, it will sail away. And if you want it kicked with a force that looks impressive, like feels like it's a weighty kick, it's just going to fly out of the <laughs> out of the field. <laughs> yeah. Right? So it's a non-negotiable that you've got to have uh, air friction. Other people made football games that didn't have air friction. You can say it's not non-negotiable, but I, 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 I think it is. There are certain versions of FIFA where... You know, I'm not, I don't study FIFA a lot, but this one I've seen so many times, it's just like, whoa. Uh, have you ever noticed that you, the ball gets kicked from one end of the field, really, and it, it lands sort of uh, within the, closer than the edge of the 18-yard box to the end of the pitch. And mm. the ball does this mysteriously odd vertical bounce. So I can tell you what that is. Um, not enough air friction or no air friction. And so to try and get around the problem that the ball just keeps going out of the pitch all the time, they make this vertical bounce. I don't know that that's the reason for a fact, but that's my best guess. Back then, um, I, obviously, the magazines made a big deal about this as well. And I remember in the playground, too, there was when Sensible Soccer came out, there was a perceived rivalry between kickoff and Sensible Soccer. I mean, did, did the magazines make that a bigger deal than it actually was? And what do you think made kickoff stand out? Well, the thing is, the kickoff kickoff came first, but it annoyed whoever produced Microsoft Soccer, which was actually probably it was uh, it was Sensible Software, I think. Do you mean Microprose? Mi uh, Microprose Soccer. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Micro right. yeah, Microprose Soccer. Microprose Soccer started development, I believe, after I started development on kickoff. I remember Anil telling me that some people were very annoyed because kickoff came out. Um, and uh, sort of, you know, stole the thunder of of this other other football game. Um, but I mean, I, it was done. I, I'd never seen the game. It was done in complete, you know, it's completely developed separately. So it comes out, and then for a period of time, it was like all all the rage. But here's the thing: is I I, I tend to think I. We get dark here. <laughs> I say, I say what I think. I mean, I'm never, I've never been really one to, to cater for popularity. I mean, things are what they are. And um, in the end, the success of kickoff was a huge problem because in the end, it means that I get it from many angles. So one angle that I get here, people, it's a very skill based game, right? Uh, you yeah. hear many stories about brothers playing games, all right? I imagine there were also brothers and sisters playing games and si play, playing kickoff and sisters playing kickoff. But I think being football and the, the, the leaning of society, mostly it was brothers. Um, and generally, one would win most of the time and the other would lose most of the time. Normally with a punch in the arm, if I remember. <laughs> yeah, this is it. The punch of the arm is important because... You know, I I just when I made kickoff, I didn't make kickoff with any of these things being things I was considering. I'm uh, twenty something, and I'm just doing what I love, making video games, right? So I'm not sitting there thinking, Dino, if you make a highly competitive game that is very skill based, and uh, the skill level required to play the game is such that it's more genetic whether or not you can play the game, that that is a component that is difficult to overcome. Now, I say genetic because basically nature or nurture argument, right? The point mm -hmm. is, is that people's reaction times are pretty hardwired. You can improve them to some extent, but then those who already have fast reaction times can improve their already fast reaction times. 
So it was a mistake without realizing it to make a game that was hugely skill-based, but one which people had limited options of improving their skill level. Because then that means that people then feel uh, helpless and hopeless with it. And this wouldn't matter. It's only a game. Unless it's a very popular game where there's a lot of rivalry. And <laughs> and so then you end up with people hating the game if they can't ever win it. And then right? people saying, I'm more skilled because I'm on this one or... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I know I know exactly what you mean um, with that with that kind of reaction thing. Definitely. Yeah. And so there's the thing. I've sort of made it with the I I made the game with the idea and if you stick at it and so on then you, you improve your skill. But there was a flaw in this plan. I, I was too young and to, to to know it. If I could go back in a time machine, I would just say my, to my myself is don't make that game. I don't. But the memories that we have, you know, that that to me was the golden age of you know couch gaming even though there was you know arguments and you're punching the arm it'd be like right let's have another go at it you know i'm, I'm gonna beat you this time that would often happen i think there was something very special about it when you got friends over or your little brother was playing those kind of games with you i think you know over online for example that feels a bit anonymous sometimes yeah i think so and i think if people are play a game like that and winning isn't important it's like plus the fact that you it wasn't like you would always lose so the one time you managed to defeat your nemesis it it would feel really good mm. right but um you know it's it's an issue and so basically uh sensible soccer sort of you could say leveled the playing field in the sense that it was a less skill based game i know that there are people who are going to go what do you mean but I, I know what i mean as a game designer i know what i mean I don't know what I'm saying. I'm not saying there's no skill involved, but I'm saying is less. That's primarily the um, modification that they made to the game design when they worked on it. They made their yeah, more like an arcade game. Yeah, exactly. It's like because there, it's the same thing. It's like arcade. Well, kickoff is like an arcade is 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 an arcade game in the sense that you know just it's the same thing. It's like those arcade style games like beat em ups or whatever, you're playing against someone who's better than you, you will never beat them, right? There's there's very little that you can do because they're so skill-focused. In some way, well, it's the same thing. It's, it's no different now, actually, thinking, thinking about it. If you're playing a, a first-person shooter, they're generally like that. And, the and the only people. difference is now that you have to go and find the local person in your area. Well, back then you'd have to go and find the local person that you could kind of beat and challenge and now you kind of do it online yeah. now you do it online which is kind of anonymous but anyway um i digress but the, the, the thing is that that is a point where you, you asked about the rivalry you know thing so the other aspect of it is is that you know journalists always need something to print so you know that's a, that's an element and so you can make a story so they made a story out of it uh but they they did it without real consideration for, you know, the consequences for those involved, which is which is pretty much always the way with journalism. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it's like there were a lot of mags out back then as well. You know, uh, game video game journalism was a lot more kind of powerful back then. Um, yes, it was. Than it is kind of nowadays. Uh, there's no doubt about that. So did they make more of it? Well, no, no, just with one exception. Uh, the exception is Amiga Power, I believe, right? It was the, the one where that Scottish journalist uh, was uh, eventually the editor. And I think that's, mm. that is Power, right? Um, yeah, yes, Stuart Campbell. <laughs> uh, yes, that Scottish journalist. Uh, so, yeah. And that, I mean, this, 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 that went to the point where if it happened today, there would be, if what happened then happened today, there would likely be a, a really expensive lawsuit involved, what actually happened there, because they, they published a fake letter yeah, from that, me. Yeah, I remember yeah. that uh, controversy, yeah. yeah. And that's how nasty it got. And it got, it got, they got nasty because I was staying out of it. And that's a, a thing that people forget. And they think, I don't know to what extent, you know, the, the view of who Dino Dini is 
what, what that is or where that's at. I, I used to trouble me that question. These days, I I I, I don't know. I I I, I can talk about it without tensing up, really. So maybe I'm I'm getting over it now. But you know, um, but it was for me. It was a huge. I was I was staying I was staying completely out of the whole thing, right? Just getting on and doing what I do, which was make games. That's 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 it. So then I because I was staying silent, uh, I got dragged in anyway, and um, this was pretty devastating. And I realized I made a mistake that I didn't sort of cha- well I say made a mistake that I didn't challenge it more. What what on earth what on earth could be done? It was there's nothing that could be done. At that point, especially then, in, in that pre-internet era, you, it was hard to get your word out, wasn't it? You know, you had to rely on the magazines printing it. Yeah, you did. And the, but the thing is, they did print a retraction, but the retraction came like two months later, and by then, the, there was everybody's minds were made up. It was too late. I mean, even to the extent that I, when I published uh, my version of the story, many, many, many years later and put it up on my website, of course there was a person there who said, no, it was you. It's like, what the hell? <laughs> oh, well. Um, you, you ended up getting on to a kickoff too, and uh, that was kind of bigger and better. And how, how did you want to improve the series then? And uh, uh, what did you do to improve on the original? Yeah, there were a bunch of things I wanted to do on that. One of them was to integrate the stats from Player Manager into it. Uh, and then uh, I had this idea of making kind of a, you know, a, an online version of Player Manager, which really wasn't an option back then. But I was thinking about how great it would be. Then it was maybe people can share their teams with each other, or go round to their friends to play the game, and they can play with their team that they grew in Player Manager. So I wanted to to do that. Uh, I wanted to. Uh, have replays that could be saved. So that was a feature that was in there. I wanted to try and solve the problem of only eight directions that you could shoot in. This bugged me a lot. This this was, for me, was really annoying. It's like not being able to aim where you shoot. So the original kickoff, you, you could only shoot in eight directions. There was a bit of, maybe a bit of randomization in at least player manager, I don't think I put the randomization of the shots in the original kickoff. Well, player manager was kind of based on the uh, kickoff engine as well. And, um, you know, it covered stuff like hooliganism and uh, the stadium disasters at the time. Was it important that you reflected like the football culture and what was actually going on? So, yeah, some of the, the, those ideas of, of things that uh, such as that was also... Uh, from from Anil uh, and probably Steve Screech as well. Some of those events, but the actual idea of having the cards pop up, that was inspired by Monopoly. So community chess chance cards. You know, basically from Anco came some of the the appreciation for for the field, right, for the area, for the for for, for the topic. But um, the real thing there is figuring out which ones. To, to keep and which ones to throw out. So with Player Manager, I remember I was having a journey with uh, with Anil Gupta. We were, we were driving somewhere, I don't know where, and we were talking about Player Manager and we're talking about the financial aspects of it. And, it, it, you know, and he was saying, you, you, you know, you've got to sort of track all of your expenses and, you, 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 you know, you, you, your income and, and so on and so on and so on. I remember thinking, that doesn't sound like fun. So I said, well, we could just cut all of that out and just give a summary. So that's the approach that we ended up with. So it, so player, player manager doesn't have all of that accounting in it. You've just got an executive summary. You know, you've got, you, you, you know how much money you're getting and how much money you've got to spend and, and, and so on. And there is an accounting going on, but the computer does that for you. And and it's sort of if the better you do, the more money you get, and sort of really that's all that matters. So I think an important part of game design is understanding or deciding what's important and what isn't. You know. Well, also it was it was kind of important to the fans to get like the latest updates and stuff. Um, were the expansion discs really important? And did you kind of 
have fun putting stuff into those and uh, getting them out to people because this was a world without uh, DLC, you know, back then. Yeah, yeah, you could say that there are many things that that were we were we were playing with that, uh, if not completely in- innovative, they were on the borderline of innovation, you know. But that was driven entirely from a, a financial point of view. The question there was, yeah, we can, you know, produce data disks with the latest uh, attributes of players and so on. And those, I would have put the data in. I think it would have been Steve who probably would have compiled the data. But it, the, the idea there is, is clearly, okay, you can expand the game without making a whole new game. And so in this way, you can extend your revenue stream, but you can also provide the, you know, the players with new content that would not be possible to do it on day one. I think that that was really it. I mean, otherwise, it's a long old journey. You know, one of the problems you get then is if there was a kickoff three, which in the end there was, but it was called Goal. But Goal was uh, a complete rewrite because at a certain point you have to say, ah, uh, in order to make it justified to have a whole new game, uh, then maybe what we need to do is to, you know, provide a whole new game as opposed to just adding a little bit of this or that to it. So if the options are make a whole new game or don't make any game, that's a bit of a stark uh, choice, right? So it's, mm. it's it kind of makes sense if you can do something in between, and I think that's that's what the intention was. You know, when Kickoff Two came out, obviously that was 1990, and that was kind of on that cusp of when you know the eight bit generation was kind of moving into sixteen bit. But obviously, it came out on a lot of eight bit computers as well. I know there was um, a Spectrum version, C64 version as well, and being a more advanced game with like the tournament modes in there and the different pitches. I mean, did you have much control over the ports? And no. Were there any that you kind of like more than others? Remember, I said it was the old cowboy like days. So basically, yeah. uh, Anko did what they liked. So I had no creative control over uh, anything that wasn't on Amiga or ST. And furthermore, they were usually developed without my knowledge. And at least one occasion, uh, two occasions, were developed with use of source code that wasn't supposed to be used. (laughs) You know, so um, it was all it was all a bit dodgy. And I, you know, when I think about that, it's best not to really go there on a certain level. But from a historical point of view, and to answer your question, um, you know, I lost control of that dragon. It 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 it, uh, it did what it wanted to do, and uh, um, you know made a a number of people better off. And uh, it's a shame um, that you know ultimately I was forced to you know break off from it. And then because it was old cowboy days, I couldn't take the. It wasn't practical for me to fight to take the the game with me. So uh, having worked on a new game, working on a new game that was a complete rewrite um, is also part of, you know, achieving that disconnection from that start so that then afterwards things were done properly uh, from goal onwards. But by then, things had moved on, you know, it was a different time. Was that a similar story with um, Dino Dini Soccer on the Super Nintendo? Because another Mega Drive version was a great hit, but it kind of went wrong on the on the SNES. Yeah, well, it, it, the, the problem there was that they I was contracted to do a version on the SNES and a version on the Mega Drive. I couldn't do both, so I had an agent, was Jackie Lyons. Uh, I don't. I think she's retired now. Uh, she she got me the the deal with with Virgin. And uh, I said, look, I can't do both. Uh, plus, the the port to the SNES is complicated by the fact that it's got a different processor on it. So it, basically, it's a rewrite of the entire code base. Something, incidentally, that Chris Sawyer did an exemplary job of. Yeah? Mm. Chris Sawyer did the conversion of Goal to PC. It would have been even better if if we had been able to use like Modex, but I don't know why that wasn't possible, but... That was the biggest limitation there with it. But he did a faithful port of the gameplay. He, he ported the 68,000 code to PC. And so that PC version plays the way it should, right? But with 
with a SNES version, um, it went to some other company who I will not name. Uh, and um, instead of uh, being faithful to the game design, they decided to just make their own game, in effect. And that was a painful lesson because then my name is on <laughs> is on that. Uh, so yeah, I made a few mistakes. Uh, that you know, the ones that you don't see coming. Um, but uh, that that was uh, that was another terrible mistake because you know I don't want my name on a game that. I've got no creative control of. I mean, by then your name, it had a lot of value. You know, you, you become a well-known figure. I mean, did you kind of realise how well-known you were and at the time in the industry? And how did you kind of handle that, you know, fame that you received? Well, but as far as I, but I couldn't. I couldn't handle any of that because, because the whole thing. When I had, was keeping a low profile because I knew the danger of getting caught up in all of that drama uh, after the fake letter, how do you think I, I could possibly recover from that? How do you think I could ever possibly look at the fame um, sort of in, in an objective and, and, and positive way? I couldn't. So I think it just, so I, I like to, you know, I don't like to say, but really the reality is I've never really, I've never had a party. I sort of joked about this with, with uh, Abriel on Kickoff Revival that I, I never had a launch party, mm. you know? So in a way there are two Dinos there's there's the the me I know I am, and then there's the me that I think everybody else thinks I am, and uh, right. that is that's what I think about it, and so I, I try and keep the two separate. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> you kind of um, released Kickoff Revival as well, and um, do you think like the the indie games kind of revolution has really helped create an environment where titles can come out and smaller titles can can just pop out as well and come onto major consoles and uh, get releases. I used to think so. I mean, that was one of the things I was excited about when I had the opportunity with uh, Sony's strategic content division to do kickoff revival. Uh, so, yeah, it seems like a great idea, doesn't it? Uh, so I gave it, uh, gave it a good old shot uh, of that. Uh, but the reality is that uh, it's like, uh, like the gold rush that kind of you in the gold rush, you would have people who would give up everything to go and try to strike gold because there's gold in dim derials. <laughs> I didn't do kickoff revival because I was dreaming. I did it because there was an opportunity for me to answer a question, which is if I had all of the technology of the modern day and I was building kickoff, how would it have turned out? I'm not saying I totally answered that question, but that was a motivator for 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 that. And then second, well, secondarily or part of it was the idea that I maybe I eventually be able to make uh, Player Manager two, because I've been waiting all my life to to do Player Manager two. So it's done with a goodwill. Is my point? It's done from a point of view of love, if you will, the love of what. I do game development uh, with uh, loving the monster that I created, trying to, to to work with that. But then when it turns out, it really none of it matters. The monster doesn't care about you. And if I had a message for anybody who's in the creative, doing creative work like this, you have to understand that the thing that you create doesn't give a damn about you. It's not going to look after you. It's not going to protect you. And if it feels like it'll rip your head off. So don't do it from the point of view of really wanting anything back. You don't, don't do it because you want a career. Don't do it because you want appro approbation. Don't do it because you want to, you know, finally get to do player manager too. It doesn't matter. Just don't do it for any of those reasons. And if, if you do that, you probably don't have much more of a chance of actually uh, being successful than if you don't, but you will have a great advantage, which is that you'll have less stress, less disappointment, and um, maybe more flexibility to see a way through that ironically might actually make it more likely that you get something you didn't know you wanted, but but in fact you did. I don't know if that makes if that makes any no, sense. No, no, I totally get it. Yeah, like, because you, you you've actually lectured in game programming and stuff, and it's like you sure. know may, may, maybe not just get wrapped so much into a, a certain title or or just kind of you know pr produce it and then 
move on or create a, a, another work of art you know keep keep that's it keep kind of going and uh yeah don't don't get too wrapped up have, have you found that you've like helped a lot of young developers and and, and students kind of i have no idea <laughs> <laughs> I have absolutely no idea if I've been of any help at all. I know that there are some people. I mean, I, I only know the story of of a, of a few, and those kind of can make it worthwhile. I mean, I know the story of one guy who was afraid of mathematics, ended up um, becoming a technical artist, and is working in the US now for a big company. And you know, and then I, I think, well, that was worthwhile. Yeah, I, I obviously helped them. As a teacher, I did my best. I have absolutely no idea if it actually helped or not. I believed in what I was teaching. And I think that's the same with games, maybe. It's like, I don't, you know, as to how I have to rationalise in my mind the utter disaster of Kickoff Revival when you're looking at it from a, you know, what it was supposed to be and what it was supposed to enable to actually what happened. Then, But then if I just go back to, you know what? I believe... In what I do, I believed in what I did. I believe I did it as well as I could and that it wasn't actually that bad because um, I know that there are people quite happy with it. Uh, but beyond that, uh, you know, it just is what it is. I've got to ask, I mean, have you got any plans to do any more games? Is there anything in the pipeline that you're considering or you'd like to do? I mean, maybe something outside the football sphere. Well, I yeah, I mean, you know, I'm a game designer. I'm a game developer. And right now uh, in my work, I'm working in the AAA field. I'm working at Splash Damage. I'm having a great old time there, and I'm finding that I'm able to make use of my skills and ability in a meaningful way. and that you know, that is great. And it's all I need, really. So the the point there is that do I want to make any indie games anymore? And I got rather burnt last time I tried. So from time to time, I dabble in some things. So um, I, I, I think that ability, that probably the hardest thing in game development right now is figuring out how to playfully make a game. That's it. Because I've tried making games and experimenting while streaming. And that was an interesting exercise. I, did, I streamed the development of Kickoff Revival, for example. Um, that was an interesting experiment. But the problem there is, is, is that slightly is that um, you end up um, sort of the, the, the streaming becomes the reason, not the playing. So uh, I am trying at the moment to putting my foot in the water, feet in the water again on developing something but I'm taking the view of I'm developing it for me because I'm the only person who's ever going to damn well play it anyway and right. just see where it takes me that's a good approach I think yeah you're not putting pressure on yourself no that's it don't put pressure on yourself well Dino and and I know, obviously, there's been many ups and downs throughout your career, but you know, I just want to say a big thank you for you know all the memories that you've you've made with your games that will last a lifetime for you know us and our audience as well. And um, we thank you for being so honest in this chat as well. It's been some really insightful stories. So um, a big thank you for coming on and uh, taking the time to be our guest. Well, week. it's been a pleasure, and uh, yeah, I wish you and everyone and all your listeners all the best. Mm-hmm.